So we're starting this session from where we left off the last time. And I believe that was verse 31. To briefly summarize, we, we are talking now about the Yamas and the Niyamas. And in the last session, we enumerated the, the Yamas. And we said that these are not commandments, they are guidelines, they lead to self-awareness, help us contemplate about how we want to live our life. And they're not imposed on oneself. And they certainly help in the purification process. So now we will go a little bit deeper into each of them. And verse 31 naturally starts with a general comment about the yamas. Then these, that is the yamas, are established unconditionally, irrespective of birth, place, time, and circumstances. Then these observances are especially potent great vows. We have heard, some of us have heard of the term great vows, Mahavrat. When you take a great vow, it's often considered to be a strict rule. This is not really in that spirit of a rigidly imposed rule on yourself. But if you consider somebody who was born into a vegetarian family. This person moves perhaps into a country where a lot of meat is eaten. In order to maintain this yama of ahimsa, I'm, I'm using the example of food here, he would have to go through a certain struggle, hardship, he would be confronted all the time with his choice. And in spite of that, when he is able to maintain that vow or the yama, that is considered to give us great power. Power in the sense, not uh, power in the worldly sense of power, but power in the sense of it gives us certain dynamic energy. You feel strong as a person. It gives you mental strength. When you do something against all odds and every time you go through that process, each and every time, you, you know, it's a little bit like Skittles. Do you know these little toys, you know, which you knock down and they stand up again? And it's a bit like that. When you stand up in spite of hardships, in spite of adversity, this strengthens your character. And so it is meant in that spirit. The Yamas make you contemplate, therefore, your philosophy of life. So if we Think about this idea now, vegetarian diets are very popular and common throughout the world. But there was a time, and there still are places, where it's not. If you have taken that up as your discipline to turn vegetarian or not to eat certain meats or not to eat meat at all, then you might find yourself every time being confronted with this choice and you think about your philosophy of life. There are certain ideas connected with this, your ethical values, your approach to animals, plant, life, your approach to life itself. So when this becomes very rigid, of course, it is not a vow, it is merely something that Ahankara is coming up with it's an idea which is imposing on itself. But when this rises from somewhere deeper, 
having a deeper meaning for you, which is related to your philosophy of life, how you want to lead your life and what kind of life choices you make, this becomes a great vow or a vrat. So time, for example, would be related to the times when, for example, 50 years ago, in the West, a vegetarian diet was not very common. In fact, when I moved to Germany 20 years ago, it was very difficult to, to go out to a restaurant or go out even visiting family because they had no idea what to give me, what to offer me, because they had no clue about vegetarian diets. So time has changed now, and of course things are very different in Germany, in Europe in general. But for example, place. In France, I believe it is still not that easy. So irrespective of your birth, for example, you may be born into a vegetarian family. And some may not be born into a vegetarian family and still decide to change or become vegetarians or even vegans. So irrespective of your birth, place, time, circumstances, when you are able to observe this vow, what you have taken as a discipline for yourself, it gives you certain strength of character. Any questions regarding this? It's important to understand that this is not about Ahankara imposing this on oneself. If it were something strict, then I think the greatest yogis would be those who are in the military, you know, in the armed forces. They're very strict. We'll tell them all to do something and they'll do it. So we tell them all to become vegetarian, they become vegetarian. Will that make them yogis? I think not. So it's not about rigidly following rules. It's about integrating this in one's life and acquiring a philosophy of life. I've just used the idea of vegetarianism because it's convenient. It doesn't mean that I am now suggesting that everybody has to become vegetarian. That's not what I'm suggesting. I mentioned in the last session that ahimsa does not necessarily mean become vegetarian. There are many layers to that and it's not just about giving up meat. Verse 2.32 now talks about the niyamas. Again, this is just an enumeration of the niyamas. Saucha is purification or cleanliness. Santosha is contentment. Tapa is training of the senses and mind. Self-discipline. I have given different words as options to help understand what that is. Swadhyay is self-study, self-awareness, or even study of scriptures, book, book knowledge. Ishwar Pranidhan is expansion of consciousness, expansion of awareness, effortlessness, and divine grace. This is Ishwar Pranidhan. And these are called niyamas or commitments. If I would use more crude terms, I would simply say they are the do's and don'ts <coughs> of yoga. And this would be the do's, the yamas are the don'ts. But as I said, these are not rigid ideas. This is helping us build the foundation. The foundation is creating a philosophy of life, contemplating on these ideas 
and developing one's own approach to life, not borrowing somebody else's philosophy of life, but developing your own unique approach to life. That's what makes this really beautiful. Otherwise, it would be just a bunch of rules. I guess there are no questions about this since we just mentioned the niyamas. But verses 33 and 34 are really important, really interesting. And um, so I would suggest to you to pay good attention to that. So, verse 33. When disturbed by dark thoughts, one contemplates upon the opposite thoughts. And this practice is called Pratipakshabhavana. Pratipakshabhavana, the opposite thought. Now, my question to you is, if I have dark thoughts like himsa, violence, or not being truthful, you know, I want to lie to somebody. What would be the opposite thought? That's a question, and you can write it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. Survi, maybe I'm just going to ask you. Nice to have you back, Survi, with your voice. <laughs> Do you want to take a guess? What is the opposite of Hinsa, violence? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's just a guess. Um, Maybe like uh, it's um, like uh, suppose if I want to lie to someone, then maybe uh, like I want to feel something about myself mm -hmm. or uh, you know like by lying, like maybe uh, to feel good about myself or uh, some situation or some condition, like maybe to make it uh, look more. Uh, wonderful or something like that or to make it look good okay Meli, thank you Survi Meli says uh, the opposite of himsa is ahimsa and Jenny Lowe she wrote to me I, Jenny you can also write to the general chat because uh, you don't have to write to me privately perhaps you didn't know exactly how to use that but you can write to the general chat to all entire audience so Meli wrote uh, Ahimsa and Jenny Lowe in the private uh, message to me said, kindness is the opposite thought of violence. Shibu, you want to say something? Oh, okay, because I saw your microphone was green. So, Okay, Manash says the opposite of Ahimsa is Ahimsa. Okay, well, I think that's natural that we all think this way and say that the opposite of hate is love, the opposite of um, greed would be generosity, etc. This is not what the Yoga Sutra says. This is not what the Yoga Sutra says. The opposite of himsa is not ahimsa, the opposite of hate is not love. There is only one opposite thought, and then the opposite thought remains the same, irrespective of the dark thoughts you have. And the opposite thought is actions contrary to yamas and niyamas, this is verse 34, performed by oneself, performed through another, or approved of, are performed through greed, 
anger, delusion are mild, moderate or intense, doesn't matter. These actions, contrary to yamas and niyamas, are the cause of infinite misery and unending ignorance of our real nature. This is the contrary thought. So, I'll just read that last line again. The contrary thought is that they, the actions, the dark thoughts, are the cause of infinite misery and unending ignorance of our real nature. That is the contrary thought. So when hatred arises in you, when anger arises in you, when violent thoughts arise in you, you can have something like an internal dialogue. You can tell yourself, everything is transitory. Why get attached or feel aversion? O oh mind, observe the impermanence of the worldly objects you adore and long for. They are constantly changing like dreams. So if you feel very attached to something, it's one of the kleshas, attachment, then you can tell yourself, observe the impermanence of the world. They are like dreams. Why are you getting attached, mind? If you feel aversion, say everything is transitory, mind. Why do you feel aversion? Right? So, Pratipaksha Bhavana is exactly what the Yoga Sutras calls, I'm sorry, uh, Pratipaksha Bhavana is what is internal dialogue. In the Yoga Sutras, it is called Pratipaksha Bhavana. In the Vedantic system, it is called Vichara, Nididhyasana, um, mana, uh, Manan. There's different names for it. But in a sense, it is the same. Where you have an internal dialogue, not a monologue, but a dialogue with yourself. And this dialogue is convincing your mind and the senses. It helps you to uncolor or attenuate this intensity of these dark thoughts. So coming back to verse 34, it is a little bit the first lines may not be clear to you. Contrary actions can be performed by yourself. They can, you can get somebody else to perform. That's especially evil, I think, when you get someone else to perform your bad actions, your evil actions. Or when you approve of someone else's evil actions or thoughts. These incorrect actions or dark actions, maybe anger, greed, delusion, and they be mild, moderate, or intense. So generally we get lost in these ideas of ignorance, delusion, greed, anger, mild, moderate, intense. But the second part of verse 34 is then lost in this. So that's the part actually which is really important. Because this opposite thought remains the same. So Paul says the opposite thought is wisdom. Yes, it's, you could say that. Yes, the opposite thought is wisdom. A wise person would say, hey, why get attached? Why are you getting so involved? You know this is changing all the time. To use an example, those who have children, parents, you know, you get very attached to this sweet little child, so innocent, so so cute, adorable, and then these adorable things turn into teenagers. But your attachment is there, and you have not seen that everything is changing. Everything is transitory. Nothing is permanent. That baby turned into a child, and the child turns into a teenager, and the teenager is going to turn into an adult. And so, mind, oh mind, observe 
the impermanence of all the entire world, everything around you. It's all changing like dreams. Okay? So these two are really uh, important verses. That is verse 2.33 and verse 2.34 because this gives us a very practical clue of how to deal with things in our day-to-day -day life. We all have moments where we get angry, we feel greedy, we want something desperately, or you get attached to some idea, you get attached to a person. And so dark thoughts, evil thoughts, may sound very not fitting to you. Evil thoughts are, yeah, there are murderers and dictators. These people have evil thoughts, not us, right? But these thoughts, which are negative, also come in the same category because the solution is the same. Solution to this is wisdom. I think that's well put, Paul. Yes, the answer is wisdom. But we need to cultivate this wisdom. It's, it doesn't just come. We have to cultivate it. We have to nurture it. And we do this all the time. Pratipaksh Bhavna, our internal dialogue, is something that you can do all the time. What I do recommend, however, is for people who have not done it on a regular basis to do this four times a day. It's a part of a practice. You can do this for a few minutes in the morning before breakfast, a few minutes before lunch, a few minutes before early dinner, and a few minutes before bedtime. Have a little dialogue with your mind. The dialogue can take different forms. This is one of the forms suggested here. And it's a good place to start. Any questions about the opposite thought, Pratipaksh Bhavana? Hi, Radhika, I have a small question. Yes. So uh, when you mentioned that when we go through these anger or uh, attachment or things like that, the opposite would be to kind of get the wisdom and uh, have a dialogue with ourselves and convince yes. ourselves that uh, attachments are not permanent, they are transitory and things like that. But let's say for someone who's really in that anger mode or the attachment mode, there, it will not be real. It will probably be just convincing and pushing a thought down our heads, which our heads are not willing to accept. So wouldn't that also be a kind of sort of violence to forcefully make us believe that all of this is transitory when we don't feel that way? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, uh, in this verses, we have just started with the philosophy of life, that is the Yamas and the Niyamas. And uh, you're right. If you are not very experienced, in the beginning, there is a tendency to almost suppress, for example, anger. When you're very angry and you sort of talk yourself out of it, the reality could be that all that has happened is that the anger has gone deeper. And in that case, it would not be a very useful approach. Very well pointed out. And which is why I said, it is a good idea initially to do this practice only four times a day and a kind of a setup when you're learning to get to know your own mind, developing a friendship with your mind, convincing your mind and senses so that these feelings in you, which are negative or dark, they lessen in intensity. Once you have developed a certain approach, then we come to the next steps. And one of the next steps that we come to 
the bisuacha or cleanliness, which I mentioned here when we went through it, verse 32, that all these are mentioned here, saucha, santosh, tapas, svadhyay. The last three, tapas, svadhyay, and ishvar pranidhan, in fact, are kriya yoga. These are the three main steps to practice. So the first two, saucha, purification, is purification of body as well as mind. And there we would learn how then to deal with deeper coloring, that which is moderate or intense. So, and then after you have done that, you can apply this in your day-to-day -day life all the time. Okay. Thank you, Krishna. Paul has a question. I have a question about practicing dialogue four times a day. If no klesha is arising at that time, should we just choose a klesha to dialogue with ourselves about? No, that's not necessary. What we can do is you can also dialogue about things that are in your mind. You don't have to necessarily have a list of klesha's and then go through it. But, for example, when you go to bed at night, just before bedtime, maybe you would like to go through your day. And, for example, you know, you had a certain event happening. You know, something happened during the day. You, you met somebody, an old friend, and some memories bubbled up from the past. And there may be something that you want to talk about with your mind. Or you just go through the day. It's actually a very good practice for memory. It really improves the memory to kind of go through the whole day. And then there may be little incidences that you may not have at that moment uh, sort of really registered. But then they come up and some emotions may come up. You may have a situation where somebody said something that you didn't like and you were just too polite and in that moment that you felt hurt and maybe that pops up. So the four times practice is to allow things to come forward that you actually didn't even know about or for you to just get to know yourself, to become friends with your mind. That's from the Bhagavad Gita, this idea to acquire a, a relationship with the mind. Most of us, we sleep for seven to eight hours at night and we have no clue what we dreamt, what, what the mind was occupied with during that time. We don't know ourselves. In a sense, we are split, you know. So this is a good practice to... Begin a friendship with yourself. Like when you meet a stranger, you don't know this person, you strike up a conversation. And that beginning conversation may end up in a great friendship, maybe a lifelong friendship. And so it is with the mind. We start slowly, we just do a few minutes, four times a day. And I know some people who have been have been very resistant to this practice and I know others who just love it. They just love it and they really enjoy it. And very often those who were initially resistant to the practice grew to like it and eventually grew to love it. So it's with any friendship. Sometimes it just, the chemistry just works and you know, you just hit off. And sometimes it's a bit of a struggle. And so it is with the mind. You start off and it's a wonderful mystery, the mind. So you don't know exactly uh, what's going to happen. And it's very exciting. All right. So I think this is a good time for a little announcement. As uh, some of you know, 
the book uh, Mastering Pranayam was uh, published as an ebook on Amazon. It has uh, two parts breathing and pranayam, so breathing techniques and advanced pranayam. It's a very systematic uh, approach following the oral tradition, our tradition, and um, it has got extensive illustrations, so over 80 diagrams and tables. So, um, if you would like to understand breathing, breathing techniques, and deeper pranayam, that might be something you want to uh, have a look at. It's on Amazon worldwide as an ebook, and eventually the print book will also be available, but that will take about six to eight weeks. So maybe you often would share. Um, a couple of links here uh, for the book for those of you who would like to have a look at it. Any other questions on dialogue? If there is anything, even practical questions, if somebody's been having difficulties and you don't mind sharing on this platform. Happy to take the question. If not, we will go on to the results or benefits of the yamas and niyamas. This is already going into the um, area of powers and deeper uh, practice. It's very fascinating what happens when you're established firmly in Ahimsa. Verse 35. All in the presence of one firmly established in Ahimsa give up hostility. So, first of all, Ahimsa here is not referring to merely physical violence. Most of us here are not physically violent. So we are talking about ahimsa or non-violence at a far deeper level. This means that the very root of violence has been removed. What is the root of violence? Where is the root of violence? At the beginning of this session, I showed you a nice diagram, which you often very kindly made for me, and I think Manisha liked it very much. She mentioned something the last time. She often has made an improved version of it. We see center of consciousness right here, and there's the latent and active unconscious mind, which we are mostly familiar with because we have done this very often, but in a practical sense, this is the part that we do not know, the part about our, of our mind we know nothing about. We go to bed at night, we have dreams, that's the active unconscious. We are in deep sleep, that's the latent unconscious, and we have no idea what happened. You wake up in the morning, that's the waking state here, conscious mind, and you have been away for seven or eight hours. And this is then the breath in the body. The root is here in the unconscious mind. These are the roots of the glaciers, these are the samskaras. And that's where it's stored. And that's why this tree appears here. And the tree is the body, the, the breath, the, the senses. That's all a part of the tree. But the roots are the unconscious mind. So the, the seeds of violence are all in the unconscious mind. They're here. They are active. 
then you have a dream which is aggressive, where you play out the violence that you cannot play out during the day. You meet somebody, he's rude to you, and you actually have a desire to slap him, but you don't because it's not done. So society has created restraints. There are certain laws, so you can't slap the person. And therefore, at night, these, this plays out in your dreams. It may play out in a scene where you meet the person again and you do slap him. Or it plays out in a scene where you are a boxer in a, in a boxing ring and you beat your opponent to pulp. <laughs> so I am using such graphic language because that's how our dreams are. That's the reality of it. And this is the root. These are stored here. That violence, these impressions are stored here. And ahimsa, being established in ahimsa, means that the very root is now gone. The root itself is gone. There is no little impression there which is violence. So it's not just violence towards that particular man who is rude to you, but violence to anybody or anything is now gone because that seed has been burned and is roasted and is no longer going to germinate. And such a person, such a one, in his presence, you will not even feel any kind of hostility. So in the presence of such a person, you will only feel love. It's hard to imagine such a person, isn't it? But actually, all of us have had such an experience. Just think about babies. Anybody sees a baby, aren't they adorable? The moment you see a baby, you feel such love because they're so innocent, they're so harmless, they're so vulnerable. And your instinct is to, to protect them. Now a baby doesn't have this glaciers of ahimsa, uh, sorry, of himsa are not, not active. But the baby is unconscious, it's unaware. The adept is conscious and has attained this state where the glaciers itself have been completely roasted and made powerless through purification. So you can imagine that in the presence of such a person, you do not feel any hostility, you only feel love. If the baby example was not clear enough, then we can use dogs. A lot of people who love dogs. I know that the universe is somehow divided into the duality of dog lovers and cat lovers. So if you're not a dog lover, just think about a cat instead. But the moment we see a dog wagging its tail and they look so adorable, you cannot be aggressive. That is why in some companies, like in Google, I believe, they have dogs around because they just calm you down and you feel relaxed and you, you can't get aggressive when, when they are really, you know, looking so adorable and come to you wagging your tail. It's hard to scold a dog when they're doing that, isn't it? So an adept exudes this love. It's like a fragrance. There are no glaciers of fear, of aversion, of egoism. And there is just what is natural overflows. I have said that before that we are blocked. We have blockages. When we remove the blockages, and the blockages are of violence or, or aggression 
aversion, fear, all these are the blockages and they block us from experiencing the love which is within us, deep inside. And when we remove these, the love flows forward. And everybody around you will experience this like a fragrance from a flower. Any question about being firmly established in Ahimsa? Okay, everyone is exu exuding love now. Everybody is feeling very good. Thinking about dogs and babies. All questions have been resolved. That's one of the siddhis that follows soon. So, verse 36. When one is firmly established in satya, Then what happens? What one firmly established in Satya says manifests. The one who is firmly established in Satya merely has to say something and it manifests. It happens. What is Satya? Satya is not merely about lying and deception. Satya is the essence, it's the truth, it's knowing who you are. So we can talk about the one who basically has a one-pointed mind and knows himself. Such a person is apt. Apt means one who has a one-pointed mind. And such a person Whatever he says comes to pass. These words, they carry a great deal of power. Very powerful, such a person. Why is that so? Because that is the power of the one-pointed mind. And what is a one-pointed mind? One-pointed mind is when all conflicts have been resolved. You have no internal conflicts. So there may be a part of you. Let's take the example of a student. Most of the time, young students today are very distracted by all the social media and, you know, they're trying to study, but the mind is being pulled away from somewhere else. So this is very distracting. The opposite of a one-pointed mind is a distracted mind. Unfortunately, our modern life is not very conducive to one-pointedness. So if you want to have a one-pointed mind, you have to work very hard for it. You have to learn how to deal with all these different stimuli from all directions, which are very distracting. Also conflicts, which could be unrelated to all these distracting things, are you may have two contradictory desires. If you are studying for in school or college and at the same time you want to have fun with your friends, it's hard to have both, you know. <laughs> at some point of time you have to say, no fun, I have to study. So there are two contradictory thoughts. You want to have both. You want to have good results, but you also want to have fun with your friends. So, we have to resolve that conflict. You all know that when you want to have good results, you need to study. So, you have to put the fun on hold. So, that is one way you resolve the conflict and you're a little bit more one-pointed on studies. That's a very... Simple example. 
But we are constantly faced with these conflicts all the time. In many small and big decisions that we take every day of our life. And many times we have a hard time letting go. And because we are not able to let go, we are not able to enjoy our life. We hold on to the past. Like parents who hold on to their little child when the child has actually become a teenager. It's no longer so cute anymore. So they keep imagining some cute child there, you know. So that is not a one-pointed mind. Only a one-pointed mind can fathom the deeper truths. The deeper truth is then consciousness. Pure consciousness is the deepest truth. And when you have established yourself in this truth, anything you say will manifest. You become a wish-fulfilling tree. All desires are fulfilled. So this is a very um, fairly um, a state of an adept. Or it doesn't have to be an adept though. As you progress, as you come closer, you will acquire more power. That's how it is explained. It's called power. It's not worldly power, but a strength of character and power in the sense of understanding the mysteries of life and death. <clears throat> Any questions regarding verse 36? One established in Satya, anything that he says, she says, manifests. Baba Rosan. <clears throat> nice to have you. Okay, then verse 2.37. To one firmly established in non stealing, the most auspicious and finest of things present themselves. So you have seen the pattern now that the Yoga Sutra is going through the yamas and niyamas and each of them mastery in each of them gives you certain benefits or results we can call them siddhis or superpowers though there are others which are to follow in chapter three but these are also considered to be superpowers or siddhis so non-stealing is the next one and it goes the explanation is what is what is stealing it's not just about stealing objects most of us are not steal, not thieves we are not thieves we are not stealing things so what is the stealing about it means do your own dharma don't copy others. Don't try to be somebody else. Go deeper within and allow that which is there to unfold and manifest. Learn to, yes, be inspired by others, learn from others, but integrate that and then have your, create your own philosophy of life and your own approach to life. Don't become a copycat. Bhagavad Gita says there, it is better to do your own dharma poorly than to do somebody else's dharma well. Why is that? Because you are not authentic. You are stealing somebody else's ideas or approach to life, making it your own. You usurped it. It's not convincing 
it's not really you. You put it artificially on yourself, and that's just a mask. It's not been integrated. But when it is integrated, it is a part of you. Then the most auspicious and finest of things present themselves. Actually, the word used is gems or jewels. What are gems and jewels? No, not no real jewels are going to appear. Jewels and gems are a symbolic way of saying wealth and prosperity. When you, to your own dharma, and you allow these to unfold, then you will get wealth and prosperity. Wealth is not merely financial wealth, that too, but wealth comes in different forms. Wealth of friends, wealth of respect and recognition, wealth of health. Health is a, is a very important uh, form of wealth that we need to have. All these things come to us. Prosperity, that's a nice word. It's not just about getting one thing that you desire, but it's about all the good things of life. All that comes to you. So, not living somebody else's life, but leading your own life, you will receive. So, non-stealing also means giving, expanding. So, if you want to receive, you must learn to give. That is also a part of this sutra. You can see again verse 37, it's a similar idea that if you are established in non-stealing, you will attain wealth and prosperity. As I said in verse 36, you become a wish-fulfilling tree. Whatever you want appears, you know, it manifests. Appears not like in magic appears, but it manifests. So what comes to you when you really remove the roots of these kleshas from within you? Then you are overflowing with love. You get wealth, prosperity, and your desires are fulfilled. That's very important to understand. It's not a fatalistic thing. A lot of people have this idea that yoga is some sort of Escape. In fact, why would you want to escape? All auspicious and fine things are going to present themselves to you. And you can share these with others. Any questions regarding verse 37? as being firmly established and known stealing. Okay, verse 38. We still have a few minutes and it's a it's a beautiful verse. Verse 38 is, one is firmly established and walks in Brahman. One who is firmly established and walks in Brahman acquires mastery, virya. This is Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya is one of the yamas and more often than not, Brahmacharya is translated as sexual continence or celibacy. Merely practicing celibacy can ne not, is not necessarily therapeutic. It can lead to a great deal of problems, suppression and um, even disease at a physical as well as mental level. So this has a far more profound meaning 
ब्रह्मचार्य comes from brahman and acharya brahman is <clears throat> universal consciousness and acharya means to walk in so one who effortlessly experiences brahman or universal consciousness it's like just like you know in your daily life as you walk around you are walking with brahman you're walking with universal consciousness in fact we all are you also have universal consciousness in you you are a vessel that contains infinity you are a finite vessel that contains infinity and when you become conscious of it through self discipline you have acquired a certain experiential knowledge you can also transmit this to others that kind of mastery is what we are talking about and mastery the word used is virya comes from veer veer is warrior and so veeras is that attitude of a warrior what kind of a warrior are we talking about not a warrior who's fighting battles uh, on you know physical battles but spiritual warrior spiritual conqueror who has conquered the dualities of the mind the dark evil thoughts which drag him down he has gone beyond these dualities of happiness and sorrow pain and and pleasure he is above these dualities he has attained to that one he has gone also beyond therefore male and female this concept of gender he sees people around him as consciousness as one universal consciousness so we are talking about such a master who walks in brahma is firmly established and such a master can also transmit this knowledge in a very different way from those who are reading books and transmitting knowledge many of you are aware that there are scholarly commentaries on this um text the yoga sutras they are almost impossible to understand because they are so complicated they're written by scholars who have never practiced anything they are pandits of sanskrit and uh, they have now intellectually discussed and um, put things down but the way one who is experienced will teach is totally different so such a one who is established in brahma is mastered brahmacharya he acquires this virya mastery and with that he can transmit knowledge in a very different way to others so that is virya so we will continue in our next session with the rest of the uh well not much remaining of the yamas and the niyamas and the results from it thank you very much for attending enjoying and um yes uh, paul uh, nice did you enjoy it on the channel so those of you who want and sometimes miss can uh, catch up on that first english our youtube channel and whenever you can participate it's always nice to have you nice to have you today paul um that you participate uh, actively as well it's always nice to have questions as i said often you can unmute yourself if you have no background noise and also speak i like to hear your voices okay thank you everybody joan nice to have you sachin you should buy the mastering pranayam book since you're interested in pranayam that's perfect for you
Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, Manisha. Bye, Perry. Bye, Debbie. Yes, such a <laughs> good. Bye, Krishna. Thanks, everybody.